I have a question uh, of the moment of death. Uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, you have some very clear instruction what to do, uh, the stages that are the bardos that you are coming into. How does our tradition, does it have any specific instructions? You know, in Tibet, the mountains are very high, very, very tall. Lhasa itself is at 4,200 meters. That's the plateau. That's the level of the Tibetan plateau. And above that, there's even more, 6,000, 7,000, some of them more than 8,000 meters. So they have a lot of instructions. In Korea, the mountains are not so tall, six, 700 meters, maybe 1,000 to 1,400 meters. In North Korea, above 2,000 also. So instructions are very simple, which says whether you are sitting, standing, walking, or lying down, talking, silent, in the body, outside of the body, awake or in a dream, constantly without interruption, what is this? If your mind is not clear, there are many bardo states. If your mind is clear, no Bardo states. Good evening. Um, I can see how my past have brought me to actually this point, how it formed my personality and the life choices that I took. How can I stop identifying with something that defines me? You should see where this identification comes from. We human beings have four very important channels of existence. Action, speech, thinking, and feelings. If you identify with these four, then your karma controls you. If you do not take responsibility for these four, you cannot live your life correctly. So how do you see freedom and responsibility together? That's the key. Because then you have the freedom to change and you take responsible for anything that happens by you on these four channels and yet you are not predefined and determined by your previous karma because you do not identify with it. So constantly moment to moment see your correct situation, correct relationship and correct function. In this there is no I, there is no ego. You make good and bad, you make me and other, you make I like, I dislike, then the self appears. You have been studying this uh, for quite a few months. If you look at Compass of Zen, we have a very interesting model of the human consciousness. I start with the top, which is the eighth, the storehouse consciousness, and the seventh, which is the discriminative consciousness. So if you use the discriminative consciousness for judgments instead of distinguishing, then your eye will be very strong. And then your memory is controlled by the seventh consciousness and all the positive and negative qualities that you build up in that. Now, if you do not want the burden of a self-image, then keep the seventh consciousness very clear. The seventh is moved by the sixth because the sixth forms the concepts. In the sixth, you make names and you connect the names to forms and connect the names to other names and you analyze and you make your Excel chart and your Word document and PowerPoint presentation. That's the sixth job, okay? So when we meditate, first we learn how to switch off the sixth. That's why we don't talk. That's why we don't do anything that would make you think extra. And the sixth consciousness becomes total and absolutely quiet. If it moves, and it's like ripples and waves on the surface of a pond or lake. The seventh would make these waves bigger and smaller because it makes right and wrong. I like, I don't like, I want, I don't want. This is very strong because all these are connected to the three basic instinct groups that we have, which is survival, possession and procreation. That's why the seventh is so strong because you're Survival instincts are all coded in it that you save yourself above all and everything else and everyone else comes second. Of course, we can override this. It's a big human achievement if we can. But basically, that's the way we function. 
Okay? The next step is the memories. So the first thing that really spills, which makes your self-image really, really different, when uh, those memories that are definitely yours and you never saw them, uh, they start to come to your consciousness. And even that is not the purpose of Zen practice, it's a side effect. But when you switch off any identification with the sixth, the seventh and the eighth, then you are on the right track to become who you really want to be. But if you identify with anything that comes through the first five, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, say, touch, and gets produced or reproduced by the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth, then your notion of self keeps you in bondage. Okay? And when we practice, we can become free from that bondage. Many people want to break that. Say, this is bad! Already stronger. <laughs> okay? Neither good, not bad. But this is something we created. This is something we've been living with. So how do we unmake it? Okay? And then you take the energy out of it. Take the information out of it. Then there's nothing that would remain. Okay? It's not just quantum physicists and other great scientists who say this world is energy and information mixed in various ways into various patterns. So if you remove the energy and if you remove the information, then that karma disappears without a trace. We call this don't know. No thinking mind, not moving energy. So... Zen poem says, empty becoming is clear like space, like a void, like a full moon reflected in the 10,000 rivers. Okay. Um, once you understand that you can become whatever you want and you set yourself um, your direction, how can you um, keep your direction and like, how can you keep it without attaching to it and let it, and let that goal uh, becoming, uh, like, how do you not attach to it, but still pursue that goal or that person you want to become? It's very simple. You don't become someone just for yourself. You become someone to help other beings. And that is much, much better than your own ideas and your own expectations. If you do that only for yourself, for your own good feelings, for your own satisfaction, for your own self-image, that's mostly what you see outside. And that's the reason why people go bonkers, why they go depressed, why they totally cannot believe in themselves deep down there. It doesn't serve anything and anyone. Just themselves, which is still not clear. What is this themselves? So if it's higher than you, if it serves something better and higher, and then that time you have a direction and you can keep that direction without being attached to anything. So you don't identify with it, but you do it wholeheartedly 100%. This is the paradox that we live with. And remember, Zen loves paradox. Because we are not logical beings. We are capable of logic, but we are not logical. You can see lives when the person tried to put his or her life within strictly logical frames and rules and regulations. And at some point it exploded or melted down depending on the nature of the person. Whether it was explosive, yang, or implosive, yin. We are not like that. One of our personality traits is that we can be logical. That's why we can be law-abiding citizens, which is wonderful. We make the laws, but we don't make the laws for ourselves. We make it for each other. Likewise, you develop yourself at least for your friends, spouse, or later your husband, your children. You become someone, not just for yourself. And that direction, that is something higher than just you. In Zen, we put the stakes pretty high. Become Buddha and save all beings from suffering. That's when you open up the aperture to infinity. Okay? So, happy journey.
This question is very much uh, about uh, Zen retreats, everyday experiences of Zen retreats, but maybe others can uh, relate and learn because it's uh, basically about uh, decision making and uh, wisdom. So we have this very clear rule of keeping a minimum functional speaking. And then we have uh, reality then that brings us uh, opportunities to follow the rule or break the rule. So it always on one side of the of the rule of the coin. If I don't speak, then okay, I follow the rule, but I may be rude or, or cold. If uh, I'm answering, I'm more friendly, but breaking the rules. What should I do? Keep your situation very clear. You are in a temple doing a Zen retreat. The form regulates the relationship. The way we sit, the way we chant, the way we eat together, the way we work together, that predefines how we relate to each other. So it's not up to personal communication where we have to explain ourselves to each other most of the time, whether you are kind or rude. It doesn't take a sociologist and a linguist and a psychologist to see that everyday conversation, 70 to 80% is always self-assertion and self-explanation. This environment takes out the necessity for that. But it's clear that it's unfamiliar for most of us. And you have to resist the habit to explain yourself and to answer the question, to to be who you are supposed to be through speech. But when you turn that energy inwards and you don't make that speech, then you see where it comes from. If you don't do that, then that karma controls you and you're blind to that because you agree to projecting that energy outside. Now, if you turn that energy inside, then you ask, oh, where does this come from? I want to talk. What wants to talk inside? And if you turn it around and you look, then you have very, very valuable discovery. What kind of emotional and cognitive habits control your speech? And this is a fantastic environment for that. So, simply put, what is more valuable? Your speech or the silence that you are about to break with it? If you have that in mind, 99% say, okay. Thank you. So then it's, then it's okay. There are designated times and opportunities where you can use your elaborate speech like interviews or when you ask a question or during work period. But when you express yourself as the person you think you are, these occasions are deliberately limited and limited for all of us. And uh, that is important not just from the cognitive aspect to turn the energy inwards, that has an energy aspect too. It makes you stronger. Sung San Sunim always said, too much speech, weak mind. If you talk too much, it slices up your mind. So, if you keep silence, then it becomes naturally stronger, stronger, stronger. And if you do your practice as well, then it becomes clearer, clearer, clearer. So, it's useful for you and for others too. Okay. Uh, so, we practice um, the songs, the prayers. And I noticed that the, the rhythm of the prayers of the songs begin began to replace the noise in the head it, correct it it became the rhythm that i eat the rhythm that i walk it be, it changes everything in my head now question is how do i stop this noise you don't I'll just let it keep on going let it do the job okay? okay when you pour detergent on a dirty floor and you start to clean there's nothing wrong with the detergent, but you have to do the cleaning and then the floor becomes clean. So 
And that's what the mantra does. It takes away the noise. It's very accurate what you're saying. And it gives you the signal. And the signal is what you read in the translations as the meaning. So do not want to delete that. Okay? It's your survival kit. Keep the mantras. You can call them prayers or chants, but they are mantras and chanting really reconditions your mind with your active participation and your willful decision. You do that to yourself as well as to all those who do the same thing. And everybody else helps you do this. So it just comes around. And that's why we do it and that's why I enjoy hearing when people put energy into chanting. Because that deletes your noise and brings in the signal. And this signal is very simple. No matter how many bodhisattvas and buddhas we chant about, or whatever scenes we invoke in the sutras, the direction never changes. Wake up, help all beings. That's it. The mantra has this command set, this instruction box. And you repeat that so that this would be the deepest and most fundamental layer in your mind. That this would shape your decisions. Not something or someone else. And then you can walk on the path and you can progress on the way. So That's why the signal is important. That's why it's very clear what we are chanting. That's why everybody knows it. There is no secret meaning. And if you agree to be here and to do this, then you know where you are going. So in this case, I should say, it's the adult version of spiritual traditions. Nobody takes you for a child. You cannot pretend you're not responsible because everything is open to you. Everything is understandable and doable and you can decide whether you want it or not. So in this way, the signal coincides with your deepest intention. That's why we are here. In Buddhism, why do we have the statue? Why not? Well, it's too general, the, the question was too, gen too general. <laughs> no. So why not? That's it. Yeah, why not? Okay. Um, you said in several occasions to keep a non-dualistic mind. Don't make good or bad. My question is, how can you keep a non-dualistic mind regarding a very dualistic uh, situation, very wrong situation. Return to this point. If you return to this point, you see the situation as it is. Not right or wrong, but as it is. And you see where that situation points. You can decide, do you want to go that way or not? Then you can make another decision. You can separate yourself from the situation. You can change that situation or you can change yourself. So. Don't label a situation right or wrong. You just have to see your own position in that matrix and your own direction in that matrix. So then you can make a decision, go with it or not, change it or change yourself. And that's about it. Every other decision kind of falls within these larger categories. But having this don't know mind having this not moving mind, having this mind which is clear like space, clear like a mirror, is the key to see the situation and the relationship and the function as they are. That's why we teach that. We don't teach that there is no right and wrong. Okay? We teach this is created by mind alone. We make that. We make that together. We make that for each other. That's why we are responsible and that's why we have to see very clearly what it is that makes it. And once we do that, what's the result? And how can we move on? All right? 